Today on Blue 58, your Green Bay Packers won't be playing in the wild card round thanks to a Week 17 win over the Lions. It sure wasn't pretty, but they got it done when it mattered most. Let's discuss. Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of thepowersweep.com. I am your host, John Meerdink. Happy to be with you here for another episode. Your Packers are in the divisional round. They beat the Lions and now it's all out of their hands. They took care of what they had to do to get to that uh, that first round bye. And now they just need a help from a, a couple other teams to, to see how far exactly up the food chain they can go. We're going to discuss a few things about this game, a bunch of thoughts about this game. Uh, usually we have a pretty strict, typical outline for what we do in a post-game episode. That's not what I want to do today. I just have some thoughts about this game, the season, and what comes next. I was... More than halfway through this game, I was expecting a loss, and that would have changed things dramatically. And in fact, uh, to kind of circle back to the last episode, I was half prepped to start this one by saying, hey, my last podcast was in a preview, but it also wasn't very good, which in a way turned out to be a perfect preview for the game. Because the Packers were pretty ugly, and there were parts of that last podcast episode, if you heard it, that were not super great either. In all seriousness, sorry about that if you happen to hear it, if you got it downloaded it before we got it fixed. Uh... Sorry about that. The quality control on that one was not very good. That is all my fault. The episode, therefore, was not what I wanted. If you heard it before it got fixed, my apologies. If you're wondering what I'm talking about, eh, don't worry about it. Maybe we'll, re- we'll release that bonus content sometime. In all seriousness, this was not the perfect win for the Packers, but it was a win. So let's talk our way through this. Here are 14 thoughts about the Packers' Week 17 win over the Detroit Lions and what happens next for them. First, don't spend any time wondering or talking about whether or not the Packers deserved to win this game. Did they? Probably not. Does it matter? Definitely not. Deserve has nothing to do with anything in the NFL. That word gets a lot of play in the talking head circles. But football, probably more than any of the other big sports, has nothing to do with what you deserve. The best team doesn't always win. And that's just how it is. You either win or you lose. And sometimes you tie, but that's kind of beside the point. You win or you lose, and it comes down to one game. And what happens between the white lines during those 60 minutes of action? Often that comes down to just two or three plays within that game. As a result, teams, players, fan bases rarely get what they deserve. Just think about what we know about with the New England Patriots. The good, the bad, the ugly, the in-between. Does anybody deserve their success less? I don't think so. But has anyone earned their success by whatever means necessary more than the Patriots? Probably not as well. And they've got six rings to show for it. The Packers won today, and they're in. And they have a first-round bye. Period. That's all that matters. We circle back to that saying that you are what your record says you are quite often. That's usually said as a negative. If you're seven and nine and you, you try to say, yeah, but a couple things go differently and we're 13 and three. No, you're seven and nine. You are what your record says you are. Well, the Packers are 13 and three. It doesn't matter what could have gone differently. What would have happened if a couple plays broke differently earlier in the season? They are 13 and three. They have a first round bye. And that's all she wrote. That's all that matters now. They're in the playoffs and they've got that bye. Second, Winning ugly has been the motto for the Packers kind of all season. They haven't had a lot of style points. They haven't always won pretty. They've rarely won pretty. But it kind of was epitomized in this game by one play at the very end. The Packers' final game-winning drive turned on a 31-yard screen pass to Aaron Jones on that last drive. The personnel in that play was ugly. Corey Lindsley's out with a back injury. Brian Bulag is out with a concussion, or in the concussion protocol, or whatever terminology you want to use there. As a result, you've got Lucas Patrick in at center. You've got Jared Valdir out at right tackle. That's not the personnel anybody wants out there in a, in a key situation for the Packers. Then you've got your execution. Not the prettiest screen in the world. Aaron Rodgers has to dodge a lineman just to complete the pass. He's kind of falling down using a weird arm angle. Aaron uh, Aaron Jones is in traffic when he catches the ball. Lucas Patrick ends up tripping and falling on his face when he's running down the field to make a block. It looks pretty funny. That's kind of on brand for Lucas Patrick. He's going to give you everything he's got, whether it's pretty or not. 
And then you've got the result. It wasn't pretty. It wasn't probably how they drew it up, but you get a big play from Aaron Jones, which sets up the win for the Packers. Thought number three, Aaron Rodgers gets a game-winning drive out of this game, which is kind of hilarious and very fitting. Rodgers was not great in this game. He was barely even good. I think you could make a pretty strong case that he was bad in this one. A big reason they were out of this game was his inability to be on target with a bunch of throws. Overthrowing guys, throwing behind guys. But he gets credit for both a game-winning drive and, I think, a fourth-quarter comeback. And that's hilarious to me because for years, Aaron Rodgers got dinged for not having a bunch of fourth-quarter comebacks and game-winning drives because a lot of times, the defense gave up a ton of those. So Aaron Rodgers puts the Packers up late, and the defense lets the opposing offense march right down the field and take back the lead with not enough time left for Aaron Rodgers and the offense to do anything. In this particular game, the Rodgers was not great, but the defense helped them climb back into the game, and the Packers won. And yes, Aaron Rodgers participated in that last drive and gets credit for the game-winning drive as a result. Was it necessarily Aaron Rodgers that led that game-winning drive? Not really. He didn't do a lot of the work there. Does he get credit? Yep. And that kind of shows the duality of how those stats work sometimes. You get credit for things that you didn't necessarily have a huge part of. And you get blame for things that aren't always your fault. That's football. Fourth thought, nothing about what comes next for the Packers would come would come as a surprise to me. The Packers could win their next game by 50, they could lose by 50, or just about anything in between, and it wouldn't be a surprise at all to me or I think to anybody who's followed this team this year. They've shown the ability to win some tough games. Just think about what they did last week against the Vikings or even this week. This was a tough win. Shouldn't have been, but it was, and they hung in there and won. They've also shown the ability to almost lose games that they shouldn't. And none of that really changes after a bye week. The important thing, and I'll circle back to what I said up top, is that none of it matters. They're in the postseason now, they've got a bye, and they're 120 minutes of football from the Super Bowl. Anything can happen. A month from now, just think about that. A month from now, we could be talking about a Packers Super Bowl matchup. Five weeks from now, because there's a couple bye weeks in there, we could be talking about a Packers Super Bowl win. That's crazy. But it's a possibility. Fifthly, my fifth thought, anything can happen for this Packers team. And at this point, I think anything should be considered a bonus for this team. Look, nobody thought this was going to happen. Nobody thought a first-round bye was a possibility. I predicted between 9 and 7 and 11 and 5 for the Packers this year, a playoff win, but no NFC North championship. They have surpassed two of those three things already this season. They are 13 and 3. They've won the NFC North, and they could arguably be credited with a playoff win thanks to what they did today because they're into the second round of the playoffs. Last year at this time, the Packers were putting the finishing touches on a 6 9 and 1 season. So this game, if anything else, should serve as a reminder of how far they've come in 12 months. That they even had a chance to get a first round by is huge. And this game was awful in so many ways, but it ended with that win and that buy. They're playing with house money, I think, just about any way you put it now. And whatever comes next should just be bonus for us as fans. Thought number six. This game is pretty much exclusively just ammunition for anybody with an anti-Packers bent. Yep, there were a lot of good things that came out of it for the Packers, but there are a lot of stuff, a lot of things that came out of it that are going to serve people who want to just beat up on the Packers because that's what they like to do. For everything good about this year's team, this game provided a yeah, but. The Packers could win their next game and be in the NFC Championship game. Yeah, but they almost lost to the Lions. Aaron Rodgers getting hot for the Packers could mean a lot for them. Yeah, but he was real bad against the Detroit Lions. The Packers' defense is legit. Yeah, but the Lions moved the ball pretty well against them with David Blau before Kenny Galladay got hurt. It's all there. And we're going to hear a lot of it over the next two weeks. 
Number seven, the Packers won this game with defense, and Zadarius Smith was a big reason why. And He might have had the best minimal stats game we've seen in a long time. The box score stats say that he had one assisted tackle. If you look at some of the advanced numbers, he also had two quarterback hits, and I bet we'll find out that he had half a dozen pressures or so, at least in this one. But more importantly, he affected the game in ways that don't show up on any stat sheet, advanced or otherwise. A perfect example comes on the Lions' second-to-last drive. Zadarius Smith sniffed out a screen pass and forced the ball elsewhere on a second and seven play for the Lions. They throw in complete suddenly there in a third and long with their third string quarterback. And on the next play, he ends up having one of his two quarterback hits. The Lions have to punt and there's another drive where they don't score any points, letting the Packers take their time climbing back in. Just a small example of how Zadarius Smith can affect the game, even if he's not putting up big stats like he did against the Vikings. Speaking of defensive playmakers, as we come to thought number eight, we got to talk about Blake Martinez. He has had a tough season, and we've talked probably just as much as anybody about how underwhelming he's been. He was even bad in this game at this time, but he also showed up in a big way when the Packers' defense needed it the most. He two-play series all but changed the game for the Packers. We're on the 10th drive for the Lions. On first and 10, Zadarius Smith forces uh, David Blau to step up, with a near strip sack, and Martinez is there hammering through the A-gap to clean up with a sack. On the very next play, Martinez gets great depth in a cover two zone and makes an interception for just the first time in like a thousand years. That obviously is hyperbole, but not actually by that much. That is Martinez's first interception since the Packers were playing the Pittsburgh Steelers way back in 2017. Week 12 of the 2017 season was the last time Blake Martinez had an interception. There's a lot to dislike about Blake Martinez. There's a lot to dislike about how he played for the Packers this season. But if there's anything that he has shown this year and throughout his career is an ability to just be there and be ready. He doesn't always make plays. In fact, you can say he rarely makes plays. But he was in position to make plays today and make plays he did, and it paid off big for the Packers. Speaking of big plays, as we head to thought number nine, the tying play came on a huge, awesome pitch and catch between Aaron Rodgers and Alan Lazard. A third and 10 play results in the tying touchdown. And is there any doubt at this point that Alan Lazard should be the Packers' number two wide receiver behind Devontae Adams? To that point, should there ever have been a doubt that, that, he, that he was the number two guy behind Adams? He's been making plays for a long time. He is the best combination of athletic traits and actual production of any pass catcher other than Devontae Adams on the Packers. That probably does not include Aaron Jones, if, if you want to get technical, but as far as anybody other than running backs, he is their best pass catcher, not named Devontae Adams. And he's produced explosive plays more consistently than anybody other than Aaron Jones. And yes, that does include Devontae Adams. He can do what I've been asking Packers receivers other than Adams to do all season long, win one-on-one matchups consistently. And he even makes plays out of the slot too. He is, a I don't want to say it like, when I say he's a great player, I was about to say he's a great player. He's a great player for the Packers this year. He's He's been great at times for the Packers. That doesn't mean he's a great player overall or that he'll ever be a truly great player, like a historically great player, but he's come up big for the Packers consistently down the stretch this year, and I hope he gets more opportunities in the playoffs. Speaking of Alan Lazard, thought number 10, a recent money play featuring Lazard got blown up on the drive on which he scored his touchdown. We've called out a nifty little wrinkle the Packers have used a couple times this year, dating back over the past month of the season. Uh, Alan Lazard in this play will start split out wide to the left side, usually, and then motion in as kind of like an H-back or a wing on the left side of the line in short yardage and then just serve as a run blocker in there. The Packers tried it on third and one, on that scoring drive and got stuffed. Can't win them all, of course, uh, but they ultimately converted on fourth and one anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But it is interesting to see that the Packers went there again and this time got stuffed. Speaking of money plays, or lack thereof, as we go to thought number 11 here, let's talk about play selection for a second. 
I thought the Packers did a terrible job of recognizing what was working in this one. Perhaps more precisely, I thought they did a bad job of recognizing what wasn't working. Deep shots down the field. They tried it again and again and again and came up with incompletion after incompletion after incompletion. And I don't know if this is an Aaron Rodgers thing or a Matt LaFleur thing, but that they kept trying to do it was frustrating. It just wasn't working. And it led to 28 incompletions by Aaron Rodgers in this game, which, according to Michael David Smith, a football researcher, is the most by any quarterback in any game this season. Their offense was working. I wouldn't say it was clicking, but it was working when they were relying on quick outs and short passes to Devontae Adams and other receivers, then taking shots selectively, like they did with that uh, that play to Alan Lazard for the touchdown. But when they went there as a first resort, it just was not working. And it's hard to say exactly why. But let's try anyway. Thought number 12. Why weren't those deep plays working? To me, I think this dates back to a storyline that first popped up in week one. Aaron Rodgers' arm strength. He has missed plays down the field numerous times this season because it looks like he just doesn't have the juice to get it downfield anymore. And I don't know if we'll ever get a firm answer on this, but it looks very obvious to me, and I can tell it looks like a lot of people throughout Packers internet that Aaron Rodgers just does not have the arm strength that he used to, even compared to last season at times. The way he played today reminded me of that 2017 game against the Carolina Panthers, his one and only game back from the collarbone injury that year. He threw a couple picks that day largely because he couldn't get the ball downfield. He couldn't get enough muscle onto the ball to get it to receivers who were open downfield. And the throw to Jake Kumaro that resulted in the interception is a good example of that. A stronger throw might score a touchdown there. It probably for sure results in a completion because it looked like Jake Kumaro was open. Some of this does probably have have something to do with his inability or unwillingness to step into throws. But I think more than a little part of this has to do with his arm. It just doesn't seem like there's an, as much there as there used to be. I don't know how that changes for the Packers. It doesn't, I guess, really. I don't know how it changes strategy for the Packers going forward. It seems like they're committed to trying to take shots downfield, or maybe that's Rodgers just deciding to do that because you got to have deep options in those, in those plays just to keep the defense honest, if nothing else. But if he can't complete those throws down the field, that's a problem. At some level, it is a problem. Speaking of things that we've complained about over the course of the season, let's talk for a second about the broadcast team. I got some great feedback from a listener in, a form, in the form of a review recently. Uh, won't read the whole thing, but they, they said, don't complain about the announcers. It makes you sound like an entitled Packers fan, which is, of course, the last thing, thing that Packers fans need because there's plenty of entitlement-adjacent feelings going around among Packers fandom. That's not, of course, how I meant any criticism that I offer about the announcers. I like just looking at that sort of stuff because that's my, my background. But if that's how it comes across, let's not do it anymore. So let's instead try to do something we like about the broadcast team because these people are professionals. And even if we, we complain about them, I think there is some good stuff in just about every broadcast. I don't have a specific thing to call out in this one, uh, but I thought Kevin Burkhardt and Charles Davis sounded like they did a pretty good job start to finish on the broadcast today. Uh, we've gotten this team several times over the course of the season, and I think Charles Davis has made pretty big strides as a color commentator. That's not an easy job. Watching a play unfold, then getting a camera angle that actually shows something interesting about the play, then saying something interesting in like the 10 seconds you have to actually talk after a play is not an easy thing to do. Just look at the amount of guys who, who don't seem to be able to do it well. But Davis, I thought, added some good stuff to the broadcast today, and Kevin Burkhart is always pretty smooth as an announcer. If if you could if I would summarize what they did in sort of one phrase, I would say both sounded in command of their material today. There's extensive prep meetings that go into these broadcasts. There's extensive research and both sounded on top of what they wanted to say, which as someone who does this is, and isn't always I I don't always say what I mean to say or or the best way that I could possibly say it. Those games or those shows or those episodes were you really saying what you mean to say in the best possible way? Are, that's a good feeling, and it's cool to hear, even even as an outsider, somebody who's not involved in that broadcast. So I, I really liked the broadcast today, and I thought both of them did a really good job. So that's something we'll try to focus on moving forward. What's something good that, that went on in, in the broadcast today? And I just thought the team did a good job in this one. 
14th and finally, what happens next for the Packers? We can't focus exactly, precisely on what happens next for the Packers. As I'm recording this, it is not quite 20 to 7 p.m. Eastern time. This is just when I'm available to record. So obviously there are going to be some things that may be a little bit dated here. But there are some possibilities here. Uh, The Packers could be the one or the two seed. We'll find out tonight what happens after the Seahawks 49ers game. If they are the one seed, they will get the lowest seeded winner that advances from the wild card round. No matter what, they cannot play the three seed in the divisional round. And the Packers do end up as the one seed if the Seahawks win tonight. They'll be the two seed if the 49ers win. And that means they get the highest seeded winner from the wild card round. That means if the three seed beats the six, they get the three no matter what happens in the other game. If the six beats the three, they get the winner of four versus five because that that outcome will be the higher seeded winner no matter what. The other seeds right now are not entirely known because some games are still in progress. But here's what we know so far. We know a couple of them for sure and the couple we have kind of slotted in. The other seeds, the three seed is the Saints right now, for sure. We know for sure that they will be the three because they have the best record of division winners other than the Packers and whoever wins the NFC West. The four seed will be either the Cowboys or the Eagles as the winner of the NFC East. They are both in progress right now, and it'll depend how those games shake out, who ends up being the NFC East champion. Both of them are winning right now. With 221 left in the third quarter, the Eagles are up on the Giants 17 to 10. And with 817 to go in their game, in the third quarter of their game, the Cowboys are up on the Redskins 27 to 13. I don't want to go into how all that is going to sort out. So we'll just say it'll be the Eagles or the Cowboys. The five seed will be either the Seahawks or the 49ers, whoever loses their game tonight. And then the sixth seed is the Vikings, no matter what. Potential matchups. If the Packers are the one seed, they will play either the Cowboys, Eagles, 49ers, Seahawks, or Vikings. If they're the two seed, they will play either the Saints, Eagles, Cowboys, 49ers, or Seahawks. Clear as mud, good. Let's just move on because a lot of this is going to get sorted out anyway with games that are in progress right now. So it's not really important as far as uh, our listening and our recording right now. But don't forget, playoff games can happen on Saturday. So the Packers could end up playing on Saturday in a couple weekends. Keep your Saturday clear just in case. I will leave you with this as we wrap up this episode. I'm very excited to talk playoff football with you for just the second time in the history of this podcast. I've been doing this show since 2016, and in that span, we've only gotten to talk about three playoff games. Packers had a divisional game against the, the or a wild card game against the Giants, a divisional game against the Cowboys, and then the NFC Championship game in the in the 2016 season as the running of the table came to an end. And it's been a long road since then. We haven't talked about the playoffs in 2017 or 2018. But now here we are in 2019. And I would just ask you, I'm not going to ask you to rate or review, to support us on Patreon, to buy a t-shirt or whatever. I would just ask you at the end of this podcast to enjoy this. Please. Just enjoy it. Have fun. It's tempting to point out the negatives. We've done some of that in this show. They are there with the Packers. But even if you do, even if we end this season talking about a Packers playoff loss, and there's a good chance that's what's going to happen. Most teams don't win the Super Bowl. I don't know if you've heard. Even if we end up with a what is nominally a bad result to the season, keep in mind, and I'll try to do this too, that all of this is supposed to be fun. And going to the playoffs is fun. Playoff football is a blast. So let's have fun doing this together. I'll do my best playoff football takes. You just keep doing what you're doing because you're doing a great job downloading the show, especially if you're hearing this right now. You've you've done excellent work. Thank you for doing that. Let's have fun doing this together. No matter how far the Packers go, whether it ends after one week in the playoffs, two weeks, or they go all the way to the Super Bowl, Let's just have fun doing this together because fun is what it's all about. So I've got for you on this episode. We'll see you later this week as we talk about some New Year's resolutions for the Green Bay Packers in 2020 as we look to the playoffs and beyond. I've been your host, John Muirding. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Blue 58.